Hey guys, my name is Yvonne Nam, and I'm the manager for the OpenShift Solution Architects for US public sector. Um, I'm really excited to be here today for two reasons. I guess three reasons, I've never been to Austin before. Um, but the real reasons are, um, if you know me, you know that I really, really love OpenShift. I've, I've been at Red Hat 10 years now, and I've never felt more passionate about any technology. Um, and the second reason is, uh, in public sector, we don't often get a lot of opportunities for us to share the awesome things that we're doing. Um, you guys know in federal, we've got pretty unique mission statements, pretty unique requirements. And I know maybe some of you guys have some preconceived notions about what IT is like in federal, but I am here to tell you, we are doing some of the most innovative and cutting edge stuff with, uh, with OpenShift. Uh, we just can't talk about it that often. So um, we're really fortunate to have um, a group of folks here that are thought leaders in their respective spaces um, that are uh, really blazing trails with their organizations on the adoption of OpenShift. Um, and I'll give a chance for everybody to introduce yourself, starting with Dave. Sure. Hi, I'm uh, Dave Connolly. I'm a computer scientist with the Internal Revenue Service in the application development area, and I'm uh, leading the platform as a service initiative for um, our DevOps work. Uh, yes, good afternoon. My name is Steve Grunch. I work for USCIS as a Customs and Immigration Services, and I'm the branch chief for Enterprise Cloud Services. So I represent the infrastructure and operations side of uh, the DevOps. Cool. I'm uh, Jason Kinsel. I work at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which is a Department of Energy laboratory, um, and I run, help run the uh, supercomputers at the National Center for Computational Sciences. So. Good afternoon. My name is Joel Turner. I kind of have a dual-headed role. I work for the federal judiciary. Uh, my main focus right now is my day job as I lead the Enterprise Architecture Program for the Administrative Office, and on the side, I'm also a Chief Deputy Clerk in a District Court in Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> Pretty impressive panel. So I, uh, I wanted to start off by talking about some of the challenges that each of your organizations faced. Um, and let's start with Joel, because Joel, uh, at the US courts, they have a pretty unique software de delivery model, and that presented some unique challenges for them. Sure. So part of uh, when you think about how we deliver software, a lot of companies will handle software delivery for their organization. All their users use those particular applications that are kind of uh, approved. Uh, and we have the same model in many respects. So the administrative office delivers national applications to the over 200 courts uh, within the federal judiciary. However, local courts, because they work very closely with their local bar, their, basically their attorney practice, there are sometimes unique characteristics of those groups. And they also try and deliver solutions to their target audience. So think about it, you have a national service organization delivering service to a wide group of individuals. And those individuals, in turn, are service providers to the local community. So you have both national applications and local applications, and that creates unique challenges in terms of delivering applications to those unique groups and then sharing those applications across the federal space. Yeah, so you're almost like a software vendor within the federal government. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and Jason actually runs the fourth largest supercomputer mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, so we've got we're an open science facility. So all the science that we run on our machines um, gets published. Uh, although we do we do do some work with uh, with industry. Um, then they they don't have to publish, but they pay for the use of the computer. Um, but our scientists, uh, because of that, our scientists are all over the world, right? We've got um, we've got people using it all the way um, from like the LHC at CERN, taking data off of um, the particle accelerator, all the way to on other on-site labs and. Um, and other, other computational uh, codes that run on the machine. And so, um, so what we were trying to solve is really bringing in, um, allowing these, these scientists to come in and use the computer, but then also, uh, also you know, develop a way that they can run their own sort of workflows, databases, those kinds of things um, in our environment uh, while still uh, being able to meet their scientific needs. And Steve is with the USCIS, and they're going through a large modernization effort. So he has a unique challenge around um, the legacy systems that they're trying to modernize. Um, but he was pretty fortunate in sort of the organizational support that he received in that modernization. Sure. So one of the things that we've talked about is that in order to get an OpenShift implementation in place or any kind of uh, strategic you know, uh, enterprise architecture 
initiative in place, you have to have senior leadership. And for us, um, our CIO kind of mandated that we that we implement the solution. And uh, one of the one of the reasons that led us to this was we one we wanted to improve the customer experience with one of our applications, and we felt that in order to do that. Uh, the best way to, to start approaching that was to actually break the service apart, um, creating the front end and part of this messaging queue. And uh, we, ended up, we ended up putting the messaging portion of that application as one of our first microservices onto the OpenShift platform. Um, and because of the leadership that we had and because of the way that we approached the problem, we were actually able to do that in a really short period of time. Yeah, I think they actually... Uh they got something to production from zero to production in six weeks with OpenShift, so it was, it was really exciting. Um, Dave, now you're with the IRS, and I imagine that you guys have pretty unique challenges around dynamic workloads, right? So I bet your workloads scale up and down pretty dramatically. We do, yeah, and that's one of the things that, you know, our filing season is January to April, so that's really the period that we build to. And right now we have, like a lot of applications, we build to the physical limit. So we have, you know, four or five servers in a web farm, and it's targeting the high watermark, which really is those four months. So it's a shame that that infrastructure is sitting there those other months, you know, from May through December, they're not nearly as busy. So when we look at OpenShift, it provides that opportunity for that scaling and for us to be able to spend the taxpayer dollars a little more efficiently. Um, so that's one of the things that we're looking at with these, uh, with these applications, these legacy applications in particular. Uh, just throwing an open question out there, feel free to answer. Um, what was it about containers and, and OpenShift that really appealed to you? What was the value that you saw in those technologies? Well, I mean, I'll, take, I'll take that one real quick. Yeah, so yeah. From, from our perspective, it's breaking the dependency between a server and JBoss. So I have people waiting in line for months and months to get a server so they can get JBoss to start doing their work. And we have a JBoss 7 upgrade coming pretty soon. These people are waiting in line. They can't get to work because they're waiting for server deliveries through our current pipeline. And I don't know what happened over the last couple of years, but the volumes have just gone too high. There's not enough human beings in the building to be able to build these servers timely using these processes that we defined over years, it has to go automated. And so for us, it's breaking that dependency between the server and that JBoss container, because we did a, a pilot test, and one of those uh, applications, the, the legacy applications, we put it on a container, it took about six weeks to convert it from an Oracle application server on Solaris running to a, a JBoss 6.4 instance. We did it on a virtual server dedicated, we did it on a container, and to the developer, it was exactly the same. He, he had no concerns which one it was. He really said, I don't care, because now I have a JBoss instance that I can actually use. So for us, that was sort of the trigger point. If we can get our developers productive, they need a good six months or nine months or a year to do these conversion efforts. We gotta get that clock ticking as soon as possible. And the physical you know, dependency right now between a virtual server and that JBoss instance is limiting our productivity. So that's one of the reasons we're looking at this technology. And Joel, yeah, for you, for a software delivery model, I sure. bet it was really so interesting. Sure. So I think for us, there were there's a lot of things that are attractive about the technology, but there were really two things that stood out. One was the portability uh, of the containers, uh, the ability for a developer to work anywhere and have an entire environment up and running and not be bound to ex either existing infrastructure or some of the services that were necessary. Those could be basically on their laptop. They can work anywhere they want. The other issue or the other attractive feature was the immutability. Uh, Change management is an issue that I'm sure a lot of people face. Uh, I'm not sure if we're unique in that regard. Nonetheless, the ability to have an immutable container and, and be assured that when you start the development process and as you move through uh, testing and then staging that application, finally putting in production, that you can assure that what you started with is actually what you end up with. And you don't get a lot of fat-fingered configuration changes. So that was a very attractive feature for us. Yeah, for um, for me, uh, it was it was a it was a good technology decision because in in HPC over the past thirty or so years, um, as a as a community, they've really bought into POSIX, right? So POSIX users, POSIX file systems. We have um, a huge parallel file system that's that's POSIX compliant called uh, called Luster. GPFS is another one, um, and so these are all at the OS level, right? And so. Um, being able to kind of use containers, and since it's at the OS level, and, and kind of use that as a, uh, you know, you can you can abstract as much as you need to, right? Since since containers are, are just C groups and namespaces, you can kind of peel back what what 
legacy applications can't, don't understand, right, be it PID namespaces or things like that. Um, but it still gives us that control um, that allows a user to come in and run whatever application they need to run. So that was the big thing for containers. Sure. Um, so for us, the portability issue was, was a problem also. We have, we have different contract teams that develop software for us. Uh, so the containers address that issue. The other part of it is that in, when we did the containers and we, put, and we built our pipeline to go into OpenShift, we kind of created a level playing field for everyone. Um, and it also allowed us to you know, put, put everything under standard, standard code. We put everything in a source control repository so that we got you know, consistent infrastructure and consistent builds across the board. Um, we made a decision early on to automate everything. Uh, we, we ended up putting our, our OpenShift cluster into AWS, and so we leveraged the cloud formation templates and building out the cluster so that we got consistency every time. Um, and then also from the security aspect, um, because of the way that, that we did it and the decisions that we made, we were able to integrate security in from the beginning. So Steve, you hit on a really interesting point. So in federal, we have some unique challenges. Um, we're not like an enterprise company where everybody's an employee, right? Um, so we've got all different sorts of contractors with different terms around their contracts. Um, so organizationally, we face a lot of barriers for adoption. So could some of you guys speak to the organizational challenges that you guys encounter around maybe the day? Yeah, I mean, I'll be happy to. P part of our challenge is, like you said, we have a lot of contractors you know, that come on board to support uh, applications. One of the challenges we have is a lot of these systems are mission critical, you know, tax season filing systems. So if the contractor come in, comes in and says, I need, you know, 50 servers to be able to deliver that workload, you're, you're kind of held to that number. So part of this technology provides me the ability to start judging that and seeing whether I need to or not. And, you know, like I mentioned, with our build processes being slow, it's difficult. Other projects get delayed while primary systems get the treatment, that kind of thing. So that's one of the things that I think that we look at is hopefully being able to sh kind of shift out of this model where we're doing server directly, you know, based upon what someone tells us, mm -hmm. you know, because we're kind of held to that contract versus the usage pattern. So we're kind of looking forward to that as we roll this forward. Now, Steve, um, we had mentioned earlier that organizationally you really had the support of your CIO, uh, which meant a lot. But you guys also employed some really unique practices to help really break down some of those, um, that, those finger pointing barriers that existed. Sure. So when we went to go to implement um, the OpenShift platform, one of the techniques that we used was a, was a war room, what they call a war room style. Um, we invited pretty much everyone, all of the stakeholders that were involved in the, in the initial rollout of our microservice. We invited the business unit, um, the operations side, the developers, and security. Um, and a couple other, couple other folks. But anyway, we, we got them all in a room. We talked about what we wanted to do, what the, what the goals of the project were. Um, and we got buy-in from everyone, you know, all at one time. Um, this technique, what it allowed us to do was it allowed us to make decisions in real time so that, you know, if, if a contractor or, um, you know, someone from the, from the, development side had a question about one of the policies or about one of the decisions, um, you know, a, a federal lead was already there. Uh, we were already there to explain it. Um, if we had to go back and forth with security, security was right there to make the decision. So, uh, you know, we didn't have to call anybody or anything like that. Um, as, the progress, as the project did progress, though, we found that we did have to reach outside of the core group, obviously. Um, this came pretty apparent when we started to interface uh, on the out, outward from the network. Um, we started getting into, you know, security certificates and things of this nature. Um, we, we did have to interface with outside groups, but we were pretty quick, we were able to pretty quickly get those folks on board um, and, and just get the job done. So. Yeah, it seems like you, you made a deliberate effort to um, reset the culture to one of inclusion, um, collaboration, and communication. I think Joel also made a pretty deliberate effort to, to make sure that everybody in his organization um, 
was educated on OpenShift and containers and DevOps and, and um, these new practices. So, so to be fair, it's not just Joel. There's a whole team of people. Uh, some of them are here with me today. They do most of the work. I'm just the guy on the stage delivering this particular presentation. Uh, the reality is, though, is that I, I wouldn't characterize them as organizational challenges. I, I think it's more about, at least in our space, uh, our groups or teams have been delivering applications on a virtualized environment for years. They know how to do that. And what you're now introducing is a new technology uh, that has you know, inherent questions about how do I do security? How is this going to impact my job? And so that's what you're really dealing with. The technology is never the problem. It's what is it in it for me and how do you get people to see the value proposition? What are you trying to solve? And then the technology kind of sells itself. So we did things similar to what Steve uh, indicated. We spent a lot of time doing one-on-one -on -one reach out to individuals. Uh, we spent a lot of time having training sessions. Uh, we created reference implementations to demonstrate how the technology could work. Pipelines delivering both internal and external to the cloud. But I think the most important thing was trying to dispel the notion that this is just for Greenfield. We have a lot of you know, older applications that are mission critical. And so we took some of our main applications that one may construe as legacy, and we started showing how those could be containerized. That got people's attention. I think that was where we started to gain more traction, is that, okay, this isn't just for new stuff. You can apply it to, you know, what you already have and actually gain efficiencies as part of that process. Yeah, and we were joking about this earlier, but so much about this technology change is like relationship counseling, right? So you need to break down old barriers that existed before and get people to talk to each other in a way that they, they never did before. Um, now with Jason, your, your constituency is, is remarkably different, right? So you have, you're working with, the, with academia and scientists, right? So I imagine sometimes they're very opinionated about their technology choices. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, and the big thing with, with, I mean, it's two things, right? It's kind of like what Joel was saying about the operational side, and that's, that takes um, a lot of, uh, presentations, things like that to the ops members, op team guys, and talking about the, the technology and then getting them in, letting them play with it, right? That, that helps dissuade a lot of those fears about operationally supporting this, uh, the technology. But then yes, from the, from the customer side for us, it's the, it's the, uh, the scientific customer who, um, who is probably not anything um, like a computational scientist or anything like that. They're a domain scientist who um, learned enough programming to do his computational fluid dynamics code and to get it to run on a computer. Um, but he's, or she's, mainly designed around getting that code to run, right? So for us in OpenShift, it's, it's getting, that, um, getting that framework so that we reduce that kind of, uh, that friction for, for them being able to do their job, to get, um, to get what they need out of the, the system and, um, and not get bogged down in, in uh, MongoDB and things like that, being able to, to just kind of uh, to do their, their, um, their scientific work and, and move on. So you guys are all in uh, various stages of adoption of OpenShift in your organizations, but could you guys share um, maybe some of the benefits you've already seen or some that you're, you're really looking forward to um, as you put this technology in place? Anyone wants to jump in? Sure. So obviously one of the first things that we that we were able to bring value to is doing the blue-green deployments. Uh, we leverage the features in, in the OpenShift platform um, that allow us to you know, deploy a, a new version of the application without bringing the other one down. Uh, and OpenShift kind of does that automatically. So that, that obviously is, a, is a, good fe a, a valuable feature for us. And from a business, business perspective, what that allowed is uh, for, for users to basically continue on with their input of data. Um, they didn't have to actually restart data entry if the service was unavailable. Yep, to reduce downtime or zero downtime even. So we're, we're fairly early in our implementation. We, we are out of a pilot stage and now we're moving to operationalizing the service. I, I think the biggest benefit we've seen so far is we've changed the dynamic of the conversation. People have bought into containers as a strategic objective and how they want to deliver applications. So you're seeing more enthusiasm around the technology, uh, more discussion about how to do it. Uh, and I think it's energized a number of people 
uh, around the technology to the point that they're becoming the evangelist for us rather than us always being the group that try and sells what the advantage is. Now you have the actual lines of business that are playing with these technologies and saying, hey, I've been able to do X, Y, and Z because of this. You really should look at it. I think for us, it's, uh, it's, the conversation is, um, is changed, absolutely, and, and in, a, in a very positive way. You know, with the scientific community, we don't have to, I don't know how many of you guys have, um, have watched like Kelsey Hightower's intro to Kubernetes, I'm sure a bunch of us have. Um, and, uh, you know, he spends like 20 minutes doing like the, the Tetris scheduling um, talk, you know, uh, which is great. Um, but what's cool in, in scientific space, we don't really have to have that conversation because the high performance computing machines already live and die by a batch scheduler, right? And so, um, so for us, it's, it's, been, it's been cool because we've been able to kind of focus in on what they're trying to do and empower them to do uh, to, to get their work done on the OpenShift side, just like they already can get their work done on the high-performance computing side. So that's been the biggest benefit so far. So we're just really starting our pilot work, exiting that and entering into, I guess, the phase where the CIO has identified this as being a major activities, assigned budget, as well as put an executive in charge. So we have that, you know, really ramping up now. We're negotiating with our partners what the scope is, and obviously that's part of the fun work, trying to explain what this, what this technology is. I will say this, though, that I found interesting from the conversations with these guys that are ahead of us. Some of the conversations are a little intimidating because it sounds like they're so far ahead, but a lot of these projects are only four, five, six, seven months ahead of you. So the speed at which you can take off is really kind of cool. So when you hear people talking about how far along they are, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, they're two years ahead of me, and now I'm finding out they're three or four months ahead of me. So I feel a lot better about where we're sitting right now. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing how quickly you can make an impact in your organization with a technology like OpenShift. So. Um, I think we have about five minutes left. Do we want to open it up for Q&A? Five, five minutes left. And does anyone have any questions for? Does anyone have any questions for the government panel? Any other government folks want tips and tricks? <laughs> it was either really, really good or really bad. Well, we, we won't bite, we promise. <laughs> It's a real treat to get these guys out on the stage. It's sort of a coming out party in some way, so it's quite wonderful. Yeah, so we, we, we kind of make this just sort of gut instinct delineation between commercial and government. Uh, have you guys seen the other side of the fence? And, and so what are the differences? Because my experience in, with government customers is they're pretty much enterprise customers. Uh, and there are different security standards, there are different data sets, but the problems uh, really span both. Uh, what are, what's the biggest difference? Like, what's the biggest challenge that being in a government organization offers that doesn't exist or does exist in, in the commercial space? I mean, I'll, I'll just do it again. Go ahead. I was going to say that one of the big ones is just technology insertion. When you look at the graph you're showing up there, you know, there's 1,050 new tools coming out every day. And for us, it takes us a year and a half, two years to get it procured, cyber approved, somebody trained on how to install it and to maintain it. So, you know, some of the restrictions we have is trying to take advantage of investments we already have, like our, you know, investment with Red Hat. Uh, we use VMware products. So if we can leverage that, that helps us a lot. We don't have quite the flexibility that we'd like to do Greenfield at times. So that's one of the challenges. I think it is unique to, to the federal space. I would, I would also add, I, as David said, contracting, procurement is a major issue in terms of speed of delivery for any solution that you're trying to do. Uh, the other factor, which is probably also prevalent in nonprofit, is just that. There is no profit motive from a government agency. Our, our drivers are, are probably more cost containment and then delivery of value to our constituents, uh, as opposed to a line of business driving for revenue or for gener you know, revenue generation or profit motive for your shareholders. So there's different drivers to get you there and the speed in which you can potentially execute because of that. Is there another question? It's because you all need coffee, right? <laughs> right. Should right. We do Between a them and cookies. <laughs> coffee, cookies Maybe too. some parting words of advice and then... There you go. We'll wrap it up. Anyone want to jump in? Well, I mean, I would just say from what we're finding is just keep muscling through. I think like the young lady said earlier, you know, you're running into these barriers. I feel like a buzzsaw. I love the Don Quixote picture that was up there. Every day feels like that as we're trying to get this sort of going. But 
it sounds like the ramp up after it takes off is just phenomenal. So we're really looking forward to that, that part of this. Uh, yeah, I guess from a, from a technical perspective, uh, you know, one, uh, making sure that you have your pipeline set up, making sure that you can automate your implementations from the beginning uh, were key. Uh, from a from a agency perspective, in terms of organization and people, uh, really, what it came down to was the relationships between different groups of people um, and their ability to you know to trust each other and to be able to represent their interests uh, in, in, a, in any given situation. So um, th those were, I think, the two key aspects, along with the, obviously the, the leadership support. I would also say don't be afraid of integration. Um, I've, 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 I think we found that, that integrating with existing um, tools and technologies, storage systems, uh, IDP, uh, those kinds of things are uh, massively simpler than, than I've ever seen before. So, um, so don't be afraid of that, that sort of integration with your existing tools and technologies. So I'll, I'll, I'll approach it from an EA perspective. Don't be a barrier to progress, be an enabler, and you will find that people will come with you on the journey. Thank you guys so much.